joy to greet all of you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ and welcome you to worship, whether you're worshiping here in person this morning with us or uh, worshiping with us at home or from another place today. We are so glad that you are joining together in worship. Just a few announcements this morning. Uh, they start on page eight. Today, right after worship, we are celebrating Cora. Cora Horse. She is um, stepping down, kind of retiring from her position as our uh, director of children's ministry, and we want to celebrate all that she has given in that position. So after worship, you can just step right down the hall to the Great Hall and enjoy some refreshments, take a little time to uh, thank Cora and just enjoy uh, visiting with other folk this morning too as well. You'll see our prayer requests and joys and concerns there, mostly prayer requests today. Please keep Steve Leslie in your prayers. He had uh, surgery on his cervical spine. We wanna keep him in prayer as he heals. Tony Young, who is home recovering from a heart attack. Kevin Williamson, who has been fighting an infection for some time now and had to uh, head up to Johns Hopkins this week. And also um, our other church members for whom we've been praying for some time now. Please continue to keep them in your prayers. Our season of recognition continues. Our next uh, celebration will be on June 5th for Jane Webb for her retirement. You'll see those details there. Uh, one special thing we're doing for Jane is recording some brief video clips, and you'll see the link there. It's also in the Beacon and in the weekly email this week at DUMC. If you go to either one of those, you can just click right there. It takes you right to the spot that you need to be, and you can just record a short message to Jane, which will be just a great video memory book for her. Senior binders. It's a tradition of our congregation to send our high school seniors off with uh, some binders full of love, some messages just to remind them that their congregation loves them, to give them some inspiration as they go forward. You'll see those details there. That's coming up pretty quickly, so uh, if you can act on that soon, that would be most appreciated. And then our final uh, celebration in our string of three, last but not least, is for Pastor B, who is leaving us, moving on to uh, Christ United Methodist in Baltimore City. We want to recognize all that he has done in the four years that he has been here and just send him off in a big way on June 12th. So details are there and we hope that you can be here on that day. Don't forget all of the other additional things that have to do with our 200th anniversary celebration that will continue all through this year. Are there other announcements this morning? Liz has one I see. Good morning. I'm gonna wait a minute. I have a friend this morning. So I'm here on behalf of SPRC. My name is Liz Elliott and I am the chair this year to announce to the congregation that officially the lovely Miss Sydney Fennington has joined our staff as a communications specialist. And so you may not know this, but Sydney also has a full-time job. She is taking this on in addition um, to working as a general music teacher for MCPS. And so primarily she'll be working remotely during this school year and a bit more in the office during this summer. But she's got some really good experience from her college days engaging the community, 
providing updates to all of the social media accounts that I'm sure I don't even know what they are because I'm in the over 50 crowd. So it's wonderful that she is joining the staff at DUMC. Thank you, Sydney. Do you want to say anything? Um, hello, I just want to say that I'm super excited to kind of take this on and push us forward. So if you want to reach out to me and give suggestions or things you want to see, if there's info that you think that should be more accessible to you, let me know and we can work that out together. So I'm super excited. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, here's your regular update of youth. Um, this is our last official Sunday for the youth weekly Sunday meetings. Uh, we're going to do a cookout, and if the good Lord holds off, we might be able to get our cookout in in between the storms, so that's the plan. And then we're going to watch a movie. So for those of you who have voted so far, Cars is in the winning lead. So if you're coming and you haven't voted yet, you still have a chance. But if I don't have everything I have by 3 o'clock will determine which movie I buy and or bring with me, depending on whether it's one I already own or not. Um, also just wanted to let you know that just because this is official end of the weekly youth meetings doesn't mean youth is going on hiatus for the summer. Uh, we got lots of fun and exciting things coming up. I will be working very closely with Sydney to make sure that we get as much on the website as visible as you can see as possible. We do officially have an Instagram account for the youth now. Um, Charlie was very kind to set it up for us. However, in my ineptitude of knowing how to deal with Instagram, I'm waiting for my daughter to give me a tutorial so that I can actually get into it and do what I need to do with it. So expect to see more there. And um, also for tonight's event, the fifth graders who will be graduating to sixth grade are invited to the event this evening as well so they can get to know some of the folks. And our first other event we'll be doing other than, is the golf outing happening? Okay, so the golf outing is happening. Um, Kelly Bratbird is setting it up and working for Pastor, working with Pastor B for a Pastor B golf outing on the fourth, and then on the twelfth we're going to have a bowling party, and probably to the bowling party we're probably going to do a few hours of SSL because we got to start working on VBS. So stay tuned on the specifics and the timing, and there will be more to come. Thank you. Thank you. No, I just, I'm so oh, sorry. I'm sorry. You're, you're wired. I, so for those of you who have gotten the invitation and the word about the farewell golf outing, uh, it is either the 4th or the 5th. We are collecting information to see the dates that are available that's best for everyone. Ke Kelly Bradbird has already been said, is, is organizing it. Um, and I just wanted to, to send out an invitation for those who are great golfers or don't golf at all but just have a day of fun and fellowship uh, as a way of saying thank you uh, to hang out with the youth and parents uh, as my uh, day of departure uh, approaches. Thank you. Thank you. I want to invite you, if you will, turn to page three in your bulletin for our opening litany. And if you'll stand, please. Change our hearts today, O oh God. 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 Let us worship God in heart. 
Let us pray. God, mark us with your grace and blessing. Let our lives reflect your light and your goodness so that we may bring others to an awareness of your presence and your love. Teach us to trust you with our whole heart and to praise you in every circumstance so that your grace and mercy might reach out through us to the entire world. Amen.
Laura and our teachers to come forward at this time. Thank you, kids. That was lovely. Thank you so much. It's all coming full circle. So last night, I uh, had, couldn't sleep, had a nightmare that BBS was running amok all throughout <laughs> the sanctuary, and now I've cried this morning because you all sang so beautifully. So that's kind of how it, it, it's how it began, and it's how it's ending for me. So I just wanted to take a moment today to thank our Sunday school teachers for another year of service in teaching Sunday school class. They are willing to do anything and everything, kind of the opposite of green eggs and ham. They'll teach with a mask, they'll teach without a mask, <laughs> they'll teach outside, they'll teach inside, they'll do, they'll do anything, anywhere in service of the kids of our church. And so I just wanted to take a moment to recognize them. This morning I have a little gift for you, so don't get away too quickly, because I know you have to get to your Sunday school class right after worship. All right, thank you very much. Can I ask you guys to come back? I'm so sorry. I just want to pray for you. Oh, yeah. Okay. We need it. <laughs> <laughs> if you would join with me in a time of prayer, let us pray. Oh, gracious and loving God, we are grateful for these, your servants who have given themselves, oh God, to care for the formation of your most precious gifts, our children. We're grateful, oh God, for their flexibility and the grace that you have given them to be able, oh God, to bend and to be nimble in this very strange time we find ourselves. We thank you for their sacrifice. We thank you, oh God, for the love that they have. We thank you, God, for their sharing and the example of their own discipleship. As they now enter into their season of rest, would you, God, pour out afresh and anew your spirit upon them that you might restore in them all that they have outpoured upon our children. Bless them and keep them. And please, O oh God, we ask that you keep upon their hearts the, the passion to serve in this capacity. Move upon us for those who have the gifts, O oh God, to join them in this service. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join me in the prayer for illumination of scripture. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you have to say to us today. Amen. The New Testament lesson this morning comes from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16, verses 9 through 15. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Trojas and took a straight course to Samothrace, the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the woman who had gathered there, women. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Theatria and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay in my home. And she prevailed upon us. This is the word of God for the people of God.
gospel lesson this morning comes from John, chapter 14, verses 23 through 29. Jesus answered him, those who love me will keep my word and my father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words and the word that you hear is not mine, but it is from the father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I'm still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave you with, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I am. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. This is the Gospel of our Lord. How often do you spend time listening for God's voice? Do you listen for God's voice in prayer or as you quietly read scripture? Or maybe it's through meditation or journaling or through art or even through paying attention to your dreams the way we heard Paul did in the scripture from Acts this morning. That passage that we heard from Acts today is set during Paul's second missionary journey. He's traveling with Silas and Timothy as we first meet them, and they're having a difficult time discerning where to go next to share the gospel. Now, just prior to that part of Acts that we heard today, If you begin at verse 6, Paul and his fellow travelers are running into multiple obstacles as they try to discern next steps. Paul's the leader of the group, and he's very clear where he wants to go. He wants to go to Asia to spread the word. But it says that they are forbidden by the Holy Spirit to go to Asia. Well, next, Paul and company try to go northeast. They want to go to Bithynia, part of what is modern-day Turkey to us. And this time it says the spirit of Jesus has blocked them. They're not allowed to enter there. Well, Paul appears kind of backed into a coastal corner at Troas. That's an eastern port on the Aegean Sea in modern-day Turkey. He's backed in there. He's kind of stuck at the water's edge by God's strange and repeated no to his decisions on where he wants to go with his ideas on where to share God's word. Well, the scripture doesn't tell us how or why the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of Jesus or God has blocked Paul and friends on where they wanted to go. We just know that they received the message not to go and that they trusted the message, they acted on it by changing their course. And I think their action is a reminder to us that God is in charge of the church's mission. Sometimes as the church, we think that we've found and are following God's calling. But we find ourselves maybe moving in the wrong direction or the direction we're going just isn't bearing fruit. And so we kind of have to stop like Paul and friends and reassess what we're doing and maybe head on another course. And that's not a bad thing. Just as we see here, that's not a bad thing. Sometimes we have to listen more deeply or more closely to find out where does God want us to go next? Discerning when God's Spirit speaks and where the Spirit is leading us 
can sometimes be frustrating or difficult if we haven't spent regular time practicing discernment. Well, finally, Paul receives a clear vision. He sees in a dream a vision of a man from Macedonia standing there and pleading with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Well, you might think that receiving a vision from God would be clear enough, that would just make everything clear. But even a vision from God requires interpretation. And the interpretation comes from the community of faith. Discerning a vision or a message from God requires the community of faith. Paul received the vision, but if you look in verse 10, it says that we, we concluded what it meant and what to do about it. The vision had to be interpreted, and that task didn't belong to Paul alone. The small community contained in that we, Paul and Silas and Timothy, and most likely Luke, the author of Luke Acts, are all involved in discerning that this is God's call. And the call is not just to an individual, but to the group. And they determine that the help that is needed is the preaching of the gospel. And they agree that the call was for immediate action. I think that for us as United Methodists, one of the most frequent ways that we practice this type of shared discernment is when someone believes that they're experiencing a call to ministry, to ordained ministry. And that person who believes that he or she is experiencing a call to ministry starts by going to their staff parish relations committee and describing that call to ministry, probably the way that Paul got up in the morning and explained that dream or vision to his cohorts, explained it to them, what he had sensed. And when you explain your call, describe it to those fellow members of your congregation, it's kind of testing to see, do they resonate with that? Do those who know you also sense that indeed you are experiencing a call to ordained ministry? And if they feel that and sense that as well, then you go on to a next step, to your district committee on ordained ministry, and you tell that call story again. Does this sound familiar, Pastor B? <laughs> and then if they hear that too, then eventually, with a, a little bit of time and so on, you go on to your board of ordained ministry and you tell that call story again. You keep telling that story. And all along, it's a shared discernment. It's a group. It's a sensing together of what God is doing in our midst. Now you can tell that Paul is listening to God on a regular basis because he has an unwavering trust in the vision. He acts on the vision immediately, and he and his companions begin the journey to Macedonia in what is now northern Greece. And the appeal and the vision is urgent, and the response is immediate. But the results aren't seen right away. Philippi in Macedonia is a Roman colony. It's a city with a very diverse population. There are all kinds of people there with all types of beliefs. And even though Paul and company have arrived in Macedonia, the place where they were led, the mission still required patience. Not much happens for a while. It says in the scripture that they were there for some days. Another one of those biblical who knows how long phrases. 
And since it was Paul's custom as a Christian who was also a Jew to seek out a synagogue when he arrived in a town or a city, he looked for a gathering of Jews to pray with on the Sabbath. Now, apparently there was no synagogue in Philippi, but he went down to the river where he heard there was a gathering of people who were worshiping. And here's where things get interesting. He gets down to the river, and what does he find but a group of women gathered for worship? And among them was a woman named Lydia. Now, Lydia is highlighted in three interesting ways. She's a worshiper of God. She's a native of Thyatira. And she's also a purveyor, a businesswoman who deals in purple cloth. Well, being a worshiper of God or a God-fearer means that she was not Jewish, but she was someone who followed as much of Judaism as she could. She embraced Judaism without fully converting. And secondly, by naming her hometown as Thyatira, it's an unexpected twist. Because in that vision, it was a Macedonian man who called out for help. But in reality, it is a woman from a city where Paul was not allowed to go, who is found to be filled with faith by this river. Finally, Lydia was a successful businesswoman. We're told she sold purple cloth. It was a very expensive cloth because the dye was so difficult to extract. It came from shellfish and only the very rich could afford things that were dyed purple. That's why purple was associated with royalty. Lydia was listening to Paul preach the word by the river, and we're told that the Lord opened her heart. And her response to that was to be baptized by Paul along with her household. And afterwards, she extends to Paul an offer of hospitality. She says, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. It seems that for Lydia, a natural result of her and her household's receiving of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is to welcome these strangers to her home, to offer them hospitality. And Paul couldn't say no, he received the offer graciously. It's a kind of odd and grace-filled story that this woman from Thyatira in Asia, where the Spirit had forbidden Paul to go, is now met in Philippi and hears the gospel. And it seems that any simple expectations about God's mission are clearly going to be wrong. When God does begin to work in Philippi, it's filled with surprise. Paul sees a Macedonian man, but ministers to an Asian woman. A group of us in our congregation are currently meeting together weekly with the Reverend Vicki Starnes to read and to discuss the book, Being the Church in a Post-Pandemic World by Kay Cotan, and this is the starting group of a visioning project that will involve as much of our congregation as possible as we seek to discern where is God calling us as a congregation as we move into a post-pandemic future. Now, one of the essential characteristics that Cotan names of a vital post-pandemic church is that it will be filled with leaders, both clergy and lay, who are spiritually grounded. Spiritually grounded leaders stay connected to Jesus as branches stay connected to the vine. Do you remember that passage of scripture in John 15, the branches of the vine? 
Cotan writes this. She says, the vital post-pandemic church will be led by leaders who are spiritually grounded. Too often we see church leaders, clergy and laity alike, who get so caught up in doing the work of the church that they lose connection with the vine. The only time spent in the word is while planning sermons or preparing for small group. Their spiritual life is dried up. Churches whose leaders are spiritually grounded produce much fruit and prove that they are Jesus's disciples. It is simply difficult for a congregation to be led by leaders who are spiritually dried up. Well, I would argue that it's not only those in leadership who need to be spiritually grounded. I think that every one of us in a congregation, clergy and laity, need to be spiritually grounded, to be mature and growing in our faith, for a congregation to be filled with healthy disciples that move a church along. If we're not a congregation of spiritually grounded individuals, it's going to be difficult for us to hear God's voice as we seek to discern our future. To be spiritually grounded, we need to spend time daily listening for God's voice. But that's not always easy. At least I know it is not always easy for me. Sometimes I skip over devotional time because I am in a rush. I've not built in enough margin to my day. Sometimes I know it's not God who's going to yell at me if I forgot to do something. I try not to guilt myself, though, when times get tough, as they have in my life since early December. Instead, I remind myself of the places where I know I am likely to hear God's voice while reading scripture, while praying, while listening in quiet. And some things that really help me when I, particularly when I listen for God's voice while reading scripture are these things. I'm gonna share them with you in the hopes that they might help you too. Reading scripture with the expectation that God will speak to me. I think that's, if you don't open the scripture and read with an expectation that you're going to hear something, I think you're, you're setting yourself up for loss. That's why we pray that prayer for illumination every single Sunday. We're not joking around there. Read that prayer for illumination. We are asking God to speak with us, that we may hear with joy what you have to say to us today. We're expecting God's gonna say something to us today through those scriptures. If you haven't been reading for a while, don't wait for the perfect moment to restart reading the scriptures. Because guess what? It's not going to come. There is no perfect moment. Just Pick a time, any time that you think you might have a good time during a day, and maybe stick with it for a week. See how that works, and just do it. Because most of us are already carrying a Bible with us. And guess what? It's on your phone. Pick an app. Millions, dozens of Bible apps that are just terrific. And if you've got a smartphone, you have a Bible. Expect that God will speak to your heart. Keep a notebook or an app, a notes app on your phone. Just write down anything that kind of speaks to you or just makes a little ping on your heartstring. It could be a word, it could be a phrase, it could be a verse. Just jot it down. Make a little note there. Ponder it. Go back to it. Read it again. 
maybe that's what God wants to say to you today. Maybe it's something you need to pray over later. And just take time to digest God's word. Regarding Lydia, it's interesting because there are no heroic deeds attributed to Lydia. She wasn't wrestling an angel to receive a blessing. She went about her life, praying, listening, doing her business, leading her, her worship, her church, her household by the riverside. But as she did, she was the first convert in Europe. What she did made a difference, and that's what we can do too. We don't have to wrestle angels out by trees. We can make a difference doing what we do day by day. Yes, we're busy, but choices do abound for us. And what would it mean if we simply wondered in the midst of all that is happening in our day, what is God saying in the midst of all this? What sorts of surprises might be waiting for us if we really took note? Who might we meet by the river outside of town? who would change the course of mission for the church and for each of us? Where and with whom might we discover and receive unexpected hospitality? This I know that Paul was open to seeing the vision that God offered him. How might I be more open to such a vision? How might we be open to that, and where might it lead us? Let us pray. O oh God of visions, dreams, surprises, help us to listen for your word in whatever way it presents itself to us. Thank you for the guidance of your spirit, and may we simply make ourselves open to you day by day. Amen. you to assume now a posture, a posture of prayer, a posture of listening. As we go before the Lord, might I, if it has not been heard, might I extend the invitation to anyone who may be in a place of wrestle as they are discerning a call to set apart ordained ministry.
we are praying with you if you are in that wrestle. Let us look to the Lord. Oh, gracious and loving God, we are thankful hmm, for the music ministry has reminded us of the efficacy of your word. Mm. Our music ministry has reminded us that your word will not return to you void, but accomplish all that it has set out to accomplish. So we are grateful today <laughs> for your word. And the reminder, O oh God, for the call to this new life of discipleship. We're thankful, God, today of the blessing of finding community and belonging among those who gather, gather to build and strengthen their faith and to live it out in service to you and in service with those whom, to whom we are sent. Lord, remind us, God, of the grace that you give us for the privilege to serve your kingdom. Remind us, O oh God, of the grace that you give us so that we might be able to be your light in the world, so that we might be your very hands and feet. Spirit of the living God, we believe, God, that you still speak to us in various ways, even in this time. Speak to us and grant us your grace that our ears and eyes might be open and our hearts might be obedient to whatever it is you are saying to us. Whatever, O oh God, you're saying to us individually and collectively so that our lives might be aligned with your will and, O oh God, that we might be on the right course of mission. Thank you, God. May we have broken hearts. As we hear your voice, may we have broken hearts for the least of these. May we have hearts for those who hunger and thirst for the evidence of your love in the world. God, we pray for those who find themselves in need of clarity and evidence of your presence in the world because of circumstances they might be facing, whether it's in grieving because of senseless violence, whether it's trying to understand why we are living in war, whether it's trying to understand why we're living in economic circumstances, why they, whether it is, oh God, they're suffering from hunger, whether it is they're suffering from mental illness, whether it is they're suffering for whatever it is, oh God, we pray that you visit them and help us to have a heart for them. God, we include in this prayer, this prayer that we utter to you, O oh God, for our world, our community, and for those in need, we include those whom have been listed in our prayer concerns for our faith community. For Steve Leslie and Tony Young and Kevin Williamson and Kenny Sue Robertson and Jane Webb and Pat Fagoning and Mary Emma Linthicum, Mary Nieder and Jean Barr and David Lingrell and Tina Sue and Sharon Warfield. For all those others, O oh God, who are on our hearts but decided not to be named, O oh God, I pray again for those who are sensing a call to serve you in a greater way. Help us, God, to be spiritually grounded. Remind us of the spiritual disciplines that help us, O oh God, to be in a posture of listening. 
thank you, God, again for your word today. We pray, God, this prayer in the name of the one who called us not only into ministry and discipleship, but even taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
with me in the offertory prayer. Let us pray. God of the mountains and the valleys, of the dark places and the oceans, your voice speaks to us across creation. The flowers and the trees sing of your majesty, and the stars of the night speak of how much we still don't know. As we offer our gifts to you and speak our words of gratitude, help us to hear your voice anew. Give us ears to hear, faith to believe, and determination to truly listen to how you would send us into a world in need. In Christ we pray. Amen.
hear the words of Jesus. If you love me, then listen to my voice and do what I say. And I and my Father will draw close to you and will make our home within you. I am leaving you with a gift, a gift the world cannot give, peace of heart and mind. So do not let your heart be troubled or afraid. Go from here to love and serve the Lord, fully confident in the peace that Christ offers to each one of us. Amen.